Hi again, I'm Roxanne Newman, conference producer for Alice Cannabis, and I'm here to introduce the next talk in today's event. Cannabis Packaging 101, Containers and Automation. I am really pleased to have Philip Harrison joining us today as your presenter. Philip is automation engineer and a proud third generation co-owner of Durapack, a prominent Michigan packaging and automation company founded in 1971. Philip grew up in a packaging and automation space and began writing packaging automation software at the age of 12. Philip has a genuine passion for helping companies scale their packaging processes. Philip, along with his brother Kevin, began designing and manufacturing cannabis packaging systems in 2015 and flexible cannabis pouches in 2018. A warm welcome to you, Philip. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and we would welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A tab below the video player. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please request help using the Q&A system. I will now hand over to Philip. Roxanne, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Roxanne and the Analytical Cannabis Group. Um, and thank you to you all for tuning in. Uh, it's a pretty great lineup here, so I'm happy and humbled to be a part of it. And I, I hope the day has been fruit, fruitful for everyone so far. Um, so kind of the topic today is, you know, you all spend a lot of time producing and curating um, your cannabis product. And packaging is kind of the last step to essentially make sure that, you know, when the product gets to the end user, it's still in that intended state um, that you put all that time and effort into. Um, so just real quick um, about me. So Roxanne touched on it. So I, I kind of grew up um, in a third generation business. So my brother and I, we, we were literally raised around automation and packaging our whole lives. Um, at a pretty early age, at 12, I actually started developing software for packaging machines. And so I kind of grew up taking stuff apart with my brother and playing with Legos. So um, we've kind of developed a, a unique and tried genuine passion around automation and packaging and most of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So we've divided today up into two main sections. Um, the first is going to be sort of the container side, the flexible packaging. So we'll dig into the details and the science around barriers and everything you need to protect your product just from a container standpoint. Um, and then we'll also flip over and talk about the automation side. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around this we find, especially in cannabis. Um, there's a lot of unique products in this industry that uh, require special considerations. So we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that as well. Um, so let's first dive into flexible packaging. Um, what we're gonna go over, we're gonna contrast and compare flexible versus rigid containers. Flexible definitely kind of seems to be the trend but I wanna give due process to rigid too because there's, there's still um, cause and reasons to stick with rigid packaging. We'll talk about the different pouch styles and types, uh, different printing methods. There's a lot of cool things happening around printing right now. We'll get into the science of barrier to protect the product. We'll talk about film lamination, the different film types and materials. Uh, we'll get into a pretty often overlooked topic which is actually making sure when you size your bag or your pouch that you size it proper for automation. Another important thing we'll hit on is child resistant closures and safety, um, which is a pretty big topic for this industry. So let's jump into comparing flexible versus rigid containers. Um, flexible tends to offer better print and branding options compared to the rigid counterpart. Uh, you can do a lot more with graphics and printing, much higher resolution felt and fidelity print. It tends to be a lower cost package. There's a lot less materials in, in it. Um, another thing that lowers the cost actually also makes it environmentally friendly, and that is kind of like the inbound freight. So whenever you're shipping a rigid container, like a glass jar or a plastic jar, uh, inbound to you, that in the back of that truck is mostly air because these things don't collapse. So you're, you're shipping mostly air, so you've got all the excess greenhouse gases, whereas flexible packaging, um, it ships flat, so it's a lot more condensed as it comes to you. And similar to that, it's easier also for the end user to carry and transport. So if you've got a small cannabis product, whether it's flower or edible, it's very easy for that person to slip a small pouch into their pocket or their purse. Um, that's a lot more difficult with some of these larger rigid containers. There are some pros to the rigid side, however. They, they tend to have a higher end appearance, especially glass jars. They do come at a higher cost. So sometimes what we'll see is people will largely standardized on flexible packaging. Um, 
but then maybe as like a differentiator in the product line, some of their higher end flower products, they may still keep with glass jars. Most jars and rigid containers require some type of labeling. There are direct print technologies, um, but it's, it's not as friendly as fle flexible packaging. So you can't get as creative and fancy on the graphics. One huge pro for rigid containers, however, is that because you have that rigid structure, it will protect the product from physical damage. Um, so this is kind of a big deal for like flour. A, a glass jar will help protect it from getting squashed or any physical damage. So within the pouch and the flexible packaging, there's kind of two basic styles um, that's used in cannabis. So on the left here, you kind of see this stand up pouch. These have a, a bottom gusset, which lets them stand up nicely on a store shelf. There's also a flat or pillow pouch, which is this style over here. Um, both are available with different steel configurations, widths and shapes and styles. Both you can have you know, zippers for resealability. You can have tear notches or not tear notches to ease open hang holes and things like that. Um, so what we see a lot of is on some of the smaller flower type products or more like single serve edibles tends to use the flat um, style. And then some of the heavier flower weights or larger edibles tends to go into the stand up pouch. So now we'll talk about the printing technologies. So there's three basic printing technologies. Um, the first two, Rotogravure and Flexographic, are similar in that this is what you think when you think old traditional printing press where you're actually physically etching cylinders to then pick up ink and then transfer it. So you have this etching process that has to be done per color and you lay all these on to make you know one final image. Um, but we're also going to talk about digital, which tends to be what we feel is the better technology for this industry. So the way Rotogravure works is you're, you're basically etching a metal cylinder. So this was originally developed for printing high resolution magazines and inserts. You can kind of think a traditionally flexographic printing originally was like more around like black and white newspapers and the need for resolution is kind of what Rotogravure was developed for. So if you look at this graphic over here, you, could, you can kind of see this ink tray and you're basically etching, which today is done with a laser process, a cylinder that then picks the ink up and then transfers it to a substrate. And so each one of these ink trays is one color. Um, and then by combining and overlaying multiple colors, you can get the final graphic. So it uses the engraved metal cylinders. Because of this, you have a higher upfront plate and tooling cost. So you have to essentially purchase one of these cylinders for every color. And then if you have multiple print SKUs, you have to buy multiple sets of these cylinders. So that kind of increases the upfront cost. Um, and because you have physical changeover and change out in the press, this tends to be good for medium to high volume runs. When you have low variation in your art and it's a little more static. So if you're printing a high volume of just like one or two unique SKUs or prints, um, Rotor Gravier tends to be better off. And then if, if you have static art where there's low risk to change in the artwork, this is another um, kind of pro for Gravier. But if you have, if your art might change from print run to print run, and if you're in kind of an unstable industry, which we consider cannabis to be because regulations are constantly changing, there's a little bit of a risk to make that investment in those cylinders. So Flexographic, it's, it's similar in principle to Rotor Gravier. Um, it tends to be low resolution. Essentially what happens is instead of actually etching a physical cylinder, it's like a rubber plate that then wraps around that cylinder. Um, so this lowers that plate cost because you're not physically etching steel, but the principles are still the same. So you're, you still have a, a physical etched device pulling ink from a cylinder and then transferring it to a substrate. Um, so again, because of that, it tends to be ideal for medium to high volume runs. Again, when you don't have a lot of variation in your artwork, and your art's considered stable where there's a low risk for it to change in the future. So the last one that we'll cover um, is digital. This is kind of the newer, more exciting realm. It, when digital first came out, you could kind of tell if something was printed digitally just by looking at it, but now the resolution really rivals Flexo and Roto. Um, to be honest, to the untrained eye, you, you really couldn't tell. It, the process itself is fully digital, so you're basically just taking a substrate through um, print heads that just squirt like CMYK or you know, ink directly onto the substrate and then it's cured. Uh, 
Um, so because of that, you don't have any physical plate or tooling costs up front. Um, and because you don't have that change out, it's great for doing short runs. The really only downside right now for digital is although you don't have those upfront costs, the presses don't run as fast and the inks cost more. Um, so you end up with a higher per print cost, but typically if you back up and kind of amortize, you know, still tends to be a winner, especially when you factor in that you can do a lot of short runs. You can have greater artwork variations. So if you have a lot of SKUs or prints, you can actually pre-print them all instead of having to do labeling. Um, and then if your artwork can change, if you have dynamic artwork, you don't have that risk and that you're making any upfront um, plate investments. So run to run, you can change your artwork and you're not going to be penalized from a cost standpoint. So now we're gonna talk about um, some film barrier characteristics. So one key carrier characteristic is uh, what people call OTR, which is the oxygen transmission rate. So this is the rate that oxygen can transfer through or permeate a given film or substrate. The unit that you'll usually see this expressed is in cc's per meter squared over a 24 hour period. Um, you might also see this expressed as cc's over a hundred square inch area in a 24 hour period. Um, this is essentially measured in a kind of like a lab device um, and it's an instrument that has basically pure O2 oxygen on one side and pure nitrogen on the other. So if you look at this graphic here, you'll kind of see the oxygen rich side, um, the nitrogen rich side, and then this red piece is basically the film or substrate. And then what's happening is over time, it's measuring uh, the permeation of the gas of one side of the chamber to the other. Um, one thing to note is that the ambient temperature and humidity when the test is being performed can impact the test in real world performance. So certain films or substrates, the, the OTR, the oxygen transfer rate can actually change based on ambient temperature and humidity. So it's common when you're reading these studies, they'll say what ambient conditions it was tested upon. Um, but to get a really good view of how a film or substrate performs, it might be helpful to look at the two extremes, especially if the oxygen transfer rate can increase in elevated temperatures and humidities. If you're going through that kind of su a supply chain and your packaged product can sit in the, you know, the non-climate controlled cargo area and might be subjected to some pretty extreme temperatures for a decent period of time, it'll actually degrade the film, which could degrade your product. So, it, so it's just something to keep in mind. Another key film barrier characteristic is MVTR or moisture vapor transfer rate. Um, so this, this is a rate that gaseous H2O can pass through a film or substrate. Similarly, it's expressed instead of cc's, it's grams. So it's grams per meter square over a 24 hour period or grams per 100 square inch area in a 24 hour period. So it's a similar testing principle in that you kind of have these two chambers. Um, so you've got like a dry nitrogen supply um, and then you have your film in the middle, and then you've got some sort of controlled RH or high relative humidity. And then essentially what's happening is the sensors are monitoring this flow and measuring the level of humidity that's allowed to pass through or permeate that film. And again, just like OTR, um, you kind of have to take the ambient temperature and humidity into consideration as you look at these values. So now we'll go over film lamination type. So a lot of people look at bags and just think that that's just one single layer of film or one substrate, but most are actually laminated um, from two to four layers is common. The lamination is often done with adhesives, but there's other ways of doing it. There's thermal laminations. Um, there's ways of doing it just by melting other resins to join the two. So the ink, um, a lot of people look at printed pouches and they just kind of picture this outer layer as being printed on the top. But what's actually happening, they often refer to it as reverse trap printing, is the ink is trapped between, in this case, a PET, which is a clear layer, and a met pet or metallized high barrier layer. So because the ink is trapped, um, not only is it protected from, you know, getting scratched off or scuffed off, but it's actually the metallized creates a barrier between that and the actual food grade. So it prevents the ink from being able to permeate. Um, and so 
each of these layers essentially brings a unique attribute to the table. So if you had tried to make a bag out of just one of these, either it would be impossible or it wouldn't really give you the best features. And so this next slide will kind of show a table of some of these characteristics. So this is just a list of common films um, and their description. These film acronyms is what you would typically see in like a film spec. This spells out what it is. And these are common OTR and MVTR rates. Um, these will vary slightly from resin to resin. So just kind of use this as a rule of thumb. So essentially what we did is we highlighted the layers from the previous slide. And so if you come down LLDPE polyethylene, um, this is tip, this is a very common heat seal layer. So it's usually on the inside of the pouch. And while it gives you really great heat seal ability and uh, seal strength, it's not a good barrier. So you, it's, especially in this industry, you don't want to create a pouch that's just PE because it's highly breathable. So not only will your product go stale, but if you have cannabis flour in it, it'll be very easy to smell through the pouch. So you can see the OTR is very high at 2,500. It actually does have a pretty decent moisture barrier though. Um, so this is why we combine barrier layers like metallized polyester, which is actually coating plain PET in a vacuum um, with basically metallic dust. And so you can see how much better the OTR gets um, and the MBTR. And so with the metallized and PE layer, you have a pretty solid pouch, but because most of these are printed, you need a way to print and then protect the ink. And that's where the PET comes in, um, which PET itself is also a decent barrier. Um, and the cool thing about the lamination process is by essentially combining these all together, not only do you get the unique attributes combined, but you actually get to combine essentially the OTR and the MBTR values. So the more things you stack up, you get the benefit of all of this. And it's, it's this combination that really helps protect the product um, and create the best possible microclimate for whatever you have inside your pouch. So now we'll get into pouch sizing for automation. This is a heavily overlooked step um, that we see a lot, but we really recommend kind of almost making this your first step prior to designing artwork. So from a branding marketing standpoint, there's nothing wrong with doing basic comps, but before you actually start laying this out on a pouch or a die line, um, the pouch itself should really be sized and tested and vetted ahead of time. So it really is crucial to the overall success of the project. Um, oftentimes people will manually insert product into a pouch and say, oh, it fits, we can run with it. But what happens is whenever you have larger irregular sized products, you actually need a lot more width to the pouch. And so by doing drop tests and even vetting the, the bags on the machine, it's, it's really critical to get that ratio correct so that when you're running cannabis flour, you're not going to randomly have jams in your process or if you've got larger sized flour in any given run, it's still going to fit into the pouch. Um, so getting these proportions and everything done ahead of time is extremely important. And so when possible, we always recommend testing with plain or clear pouches before you do any sort of commitment to like a higher volume print run. Um, there's manual drop tests you can do, which we do a lot of here, but if you actually have the automation or if you can work with your automation supplier, it's even better if you can run plain pouches on the machine with real product and fully vet it before you make that commitment. So I'd like to touch on child resistant closures. Um, there's a lot of cool things happening around this space. It, it used to be slim pickings around this, but there's a lot of different styles and options coming out now for child resistant closures. Uh, one important step is to make sure you verify the certification, um, especially a certification that satisfies whatever your local regulations are. It's also important to kind of vet the full supply chain. So that zipper, that resealable feature is only one part of the whole child resistance picture. Um, so. It, it's important to not only make sure you have a solid closure and a zipper, but you have to make sure it's being attached to a stable film. So the film itself won't tear. And then you really have to vet where the final pouch is being manufactured because you can have the greatest film and the greatest zipper in the world. But if the process that is forming and sealing all these components together, isn't stable and reliable, um, you're going to end up with what essentially is a non child resistant pouch, even if you're making it out of good materials. Um, another thing to note is that, you know, through the vetting and the testing of child resistance, it's important that it prevents child access, um, but it actually still has to be easily accessible for seniors. So this is actually part of a lot of child resistant testing 
is sample containers were going to a room for, full of children and the children um, shouldn't be able to access it, but then it tends to also go into a room full of seniors and they have to be able to open it. So we'll touch on child resistant film. So it really needs to support a strong seal and a strength and a bond. Um, if you have the greatest child resistant closure in the world, if the kid can just you know rip through the bag or rip through the film, it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, Puncture resistance is another key quality, and this kind of protects against, you know, a kid maybe using their teeth or biting, um, along with tear resistance. So you want to make sure if there is a puncture that the film just doesn't easily tear, so the kid can easily get into the pouch. All of these items, they're kind of achieved through a variety of methods. So the different film types can help. Certain uh, resins like nylon are stronger than others, so having nylon in the layer can help but there's actually more of a science than lamination in that how you orient the structures during the lamination process and the actual lamination method you use um, kind of can impact the, these items as well. So it's important to work with your supplier on this and make sure that not only do you have the right resins, but the lamination process will support child resistance. So that kind of concludes phase one of this talking about the the flexible packaging and the container slide now we're going to switch to the automation equipment and the machine side um, so we'll go over weighing product versus counting product and how that can be done um, in cannabis a lot of flower products are sold by weight a lot of edibles are sold by count so we'll go over that there's two basic types of weighing algorithms um, one is combination and another is linear net weighing after we talk about some of the basics around the equipment, we'll kind of contrast them about, you know, which ones might be best for flower versus which ones might be best for edibles. We'll talk about MAP or modified atmospheric packaging, um, often referred to as just gas flushing, which is usually done to help um, protect and extend shelf life. We'll talk about printing and labeling, um, both for variable data and for lot code and date code and traceability. And then we'll also talk about package inspection um, to make sure that you know your final package is hermetically sealed and you don't have anything foreign in it and how we can detect this automatically. And then another thing we'll touch on is the footprint and utility requirements. It's, this is especially big for areas that um, where cannabis might just now be coming legal or maybe it was legal for medical, which would would be lower volume for a lot of people and then it's going recreational, which means there's a lot of higher volume. A lot of initial facilities may not support either the footprint or the utility requirements for automation. So we'll just touch on a few points there. And then we'll talk about scaling and sort of right sizing your automation and making sure that you're not just trying to automate to the hilt that whatever you're buying um, is actually serving the real need. And sometimes it does make sense to maybe automate a little bit less. So we'll go over why that might be. So our first topic, we're gonna to discuss weighing versus counting um, and the different technologies you can leverage to get this done. So there's two basic types of counting. There's optical counting, which is gonna use some type of a sensor or camera vision system. And then there's weight counting, which is actually gonna use scale technology in a load cell. Um, so products can be weighed or counted using either. Um, the one thing about optical counting, however, is you're essentially putting your product in front of you know some optical device and so it's really critical that you have strict product orientation and that they're single file and you're not you know dropping globs of them at a single time um, whereas weight-based counting can take a lot more randomness in the product flow but it does require a consistent piece weight so you can drop two at a time they don't need to be perfectly singulated however if within your product you know a single piece might weigh one gram, but then the next piece might weigh two grams, that's gonna create an error in weight counting. Um, one pro, however, for weight-based count systems is that your, your average weight-based counting system can actually toggle between count um, or weight. So if you're selling by weight and count, usually it's just like a software option to switch modes, which could, could, could be a key pro for weight-based counting. So this kind of shows an example uh, that I touched on prior of counting by weight. So if you look at you know, these two gummies at the top uh, where there's separation, an optical system will easily pick these up and count them as two. Um, 
if you look at the lower example where there's kind of two gummies stuck together, an optical system may count these as one, or it might be able to detect like, hey, there's an anomaly, this is not normal. And instead of counting it as run, you know, it might be able to reject it or alarm, but it's very difficult for an optical system to see this as two, whereas a weight, because it's just going by an average piece weight, will easily pick these up as two. Um, so this is a video of just a, a system. This is a weight-based counting system. So you can kind of see the, the two lanes of product um, and they're falling into a common bucket that's actually sitting on a scale. And so because we're weighing these and these have a pretty consistent piece weight, it's okay that they're not perfectly single file. If we drop two at a time because we're weighing, we'll actually pick up on the fact that we drop two at a time. If this was an optical system, you'd have to have very strict product flow and separation in order to be able to count them effectively. So now we'll talk about the two main ways of weighing product. Um, and this applies whether you're actually selling by weight or you're doing weight-based counting. So the system that we just saw the video of is uses the linear net weighing principle, which is basically within some single holding hopper or bucket you're feeding product into. And so this technology works really well if you're doing something small or granular that doesn't have a very large or irregular change in item size or item weight. So if you picture maybe like a ground cannabis, but if you're doing something like flour where you have large irregular size shapes, um, that's where the technology starts to break down. And we'll, we'll kind of show you an example of that. So imagine something like cannabis flour and the first piece falls in and it's smaller and it might weigh 10 grams. And then you've got different size pieces. And so this is kind of like you're accumulating weight. And the target that we're trying to hit is 30 grams. So here we are at 21 and then we get a smaller piece and then we're at 25. So ideally, you want either some more smaller pieces or maybe a little bit larger one that at most weighs five grams. But here you go, now you get a larger piece and now you're at 35 grams. So you've essentially overfilled this by five grams. So the way to solve this is to use a different weighing technology and that's combination weighing. And so the way combination weighing works is instead of one large collection scale bucket here, you have several small ones. Um, in this example, there's 10, uh, 10 is pretty common. With, with 10 scale buckets, at any given point, you actually have over a thousand combinations that hit the correct weight. So in this example, you're gonna get smaller amounts into these different buckets. And then, so you can see the different piece sizes and then the given weights below. And what's gonna happen is the software algorithm that runs this system is rapidly gonna look at all these weights and figure out what random combination is gonna give you the 30 grams. So it's gonna say, okay, if I take this bucket, that bucket, this one, and this one, and drop all of those, I'll get a 30 gram final weight. And so it's this technology that lets you run irregular state products like cannabis flour and still be able to get a very accurate final weight. So now we'll contrast the differences on the automation side between flour packaging and edible packaging. So flour packaging, it's, it's a very unique product, so it requires very gentle handling. Um, you really want to protect the trichomes and everything that goes into your cannabis flower. It's a very light product, so it needs extremely high resolution scales. As we kind of illustrated in the previous slide, it, you really need the combination weighing principle um, to make this effective. And flower packaging really does require uh, purpose-built solutions. So as you'll see in the edible side, you can use a lot of food packaging machines, maybe slightly customized. Um, but one mistake we see a lot of is people trying to pack cannabis flour on you know, similar machines that you would run potato chips and another food product. Um, and there really is just so many unique things about cannabis flour that it, it really does need to be a purpose-built solution. So on the edible side, um, like I touched on, you can use some standard food packaging machines because a lot of the edible side is just you know, THC infused versions of real food or treats. Um, you can use combination or linear net weighing. A lot of this has to do with the speed versus accuracy that you want. Um, if you're filling a larger quantity of something, especially like in the CBD space, you can often get away with using linear net weighing. If you're doing lower counts of maybe THC edibles or you just need a lot of high speed, that's where combination weighing really comes into place. And then again, often what we see in edibles is that 
a lot of these products are sold by count, not weight. So addressing the optical versus weight counting method um, is something that needs to be addressed. So now we'll jump into gas flushing or MAP um, modified atmospheric packaging. Um, so essentially it's pretty basic. You're just removing the oxygen in a package. And the way you do this is just by back flushing it and replacing it with an inert gas. The most common use is nitrogen. Um, this is essentially done to extend shelf life. It's very important that this is used in conjunction with high barrier films, something with a low OTR or oxygen transmission rate. Um, one mistake we see a lot is people will put all the time and effort and cost into a gas flushing system and flush to a low residual O2, but then the barrier, their pouch is so poor that the oxygen permeates the film um, and it kind of defeats the purpose. So another cool thing you can do with gas flushing is actually create a protective cushion. So if you think about, um, you know, like your typical bag of chips, those bags tend to be blown open with air, but it's not just, you know, straight atmosphere air that we breathe. It's actually gas flush down to like a three to 6%. So they're actually doing two things when they do that. They're, they're back flushing out all the oxygen, um, but they're blowing it open like a balloon kind of so that if it's dropped or anything, or as it's in transit, it's going to protect the chips on the inside. Um, another thing I'd like to point out too is you see this device over here. This is just a snapshot of your typical O2 analyzer. It's a very basic machine with kind of a probe that you can use to puncture a package and it'll bring a sample of air in and measure the O2 content. It's very important to use these instruments not only when you're setting up and kind of calibrating your gas flushing process, but also cyclically as part of your QA standards. You want to test a certain percentage of packages to make sure that you're gas flushing effectively. Um, this is another thing we see is that people will gas flush and do tens of thousands of packages without testing, which means those packages could have shipped out with, you know, a standard, you know, 20 ish percent O2 level and maybe not the lower two to 3% that you're going after. So now we'll talk about printing and labeling. Um, this is often done just to print variable data just in time. That isn't something that would be pre-printed on the package. Uh, this is super important in cannabis because regulations are constantly changing. This is where a lot of your traceability comes into play. Um, and another cool thing with these technologies is this is, tends to be a great point for ERP and QA integration. So a lot of the technologies we're gonna show you, these machines tend to come equipped with, you know, ethernet ports and software layers to kind of close loop your process. So the first method um, that we're gonna talk about is inkjet. Um, we'll also talk about thermal transfer technologies, and then also print and apply labeling. So inkjet, it's a very, very high speed technology. Um, it does come with the lower resolution and print fidelity. So it's, it's pretty easy to tell when something has gone through an inkjet process, because when you look close, you can see sort of the individual ink droplets that make it up. Um, so this makes it great for basic date or lot coding, but it's not so much recommended if you're trying to print barcodes or additional variable product info. And that's because of the lower resolution and kind of the lower capability of the unit. Um, you're going to end up with barcodes that aren't completely readable, or if you're trying to print strain information or something like that, you might get a blip where important information is actually missed and not printed at all. Um, one of the benefits, however, for inkjet is because you basically just have this inkjet head that can throw ink, you know, over an inch at anything moving by it. You can print on virtually anything. So you can print on rigid or flexible packaging. Thermal transfer, um, it's not as high speed as inkjet. It does keep up with some pretty high equipment throughputs though, but it is substantially high res higher resolution than inkjet. So this is a lot more ideal for barcodes and extended um, product info and data. Um, if you want to do variable information like strain information that needs to be printed on the fly, it's a good fit for that. Um, one thing, however, is you, you essentially have this flexible ribbon that is heated up to transfer the ink onto the substrate below. So because of that process, it's usually a better fit for flexible packaging. Um, that transfer process on, you know, something like a round drawer isn't gonna work so well. So we typically recommend and see this only in flexible packaging. The last thing we'll cover is print and apply. So this uses the same thermal transfer technology to do the physical printing um, that we touched on in the prior slide. The, the difference is the data is printed on a label and then it's applied to the final product. 
So because it uses that same higher resolution thermal print technology, um, it is more ideal for barcodes and additional product information. Because you have the overhead of printing a label and then having to go out with an actuator and apply it to something and then come back and print the next one, there's a longer cycle time there. So it's better for lower speed and throughput requirements. Um, but again, because you're applying a label and that application process can be customized to virtually anything, um, this can be used for rigid or flexible packaging. So now we'll get into the importance of package inspection. So we'll cover some basic technologies. We'll go over check weighing just to make sure that, you know, whatever's shipping out meets the weight or the count that you committed to on your labeling. We'll talk about metal detection for picking up foreign material inside the package. We'll talk about x-ray, um, which is kind of a higher end way of picking up contaminants. And then we'll also talk about seal testing to make sure that, especially on the flexible side, whatever you're shipping out has a full hermetic seal in it. So check weighing systems, um, they just authenticate the final weight. If you look at this here, um, this is just kind of like a weigh belt that it just looks like a conveyor and as products pass over it, it's just gonna validate the weight in real time. Um, so this eliminates under and overfilling. In food and other industries, this is more just to make sure that, you know, the commitment from the supplier to the retailer is made that if you say it's 12 ounces of chips, it's 12 ounces of chips. But um, in cannabis, there's a lot of legal compliance issues around this because there's a lot of claims made on THC content in the, in the total package. So it can be a much larger issue if you're running without check weighing. So it's very important to validate. Um, one cool thing that's often overlooked on check weighers is it really facilitates better data collection and reporting. So a lot of check weighers come with some pretty powerful statistical packages. So if you look at an automated production line, check weighers tend to be more towards the middle or end. And so not only does it know the throughput of the line, but it knows you know, the weight of every package. And then if you combine this with something more closed loop like barcode scanning, you can get a lot much better data um, off your packaging operation in your plant floor. So metal detection, it basically detects ferrous and other metal contaminants inside a pouch or other package. Um, this is big for customer safety, you know, to make sure foreign stuff or razor blades that were used to cut open stuff within your facility doesn't make it in a final package, which essentially protects your brand. Um, metal detection was kind of like one of the original entry level solutions for detecting foreign material, but it, it is limited in that it requires other things to be done within your facility if you really wanted to detect other contaminants. So it's very common that plastics are used in manufacturing machines and that's one thing that metal detectors are designed to do that if a loose nut or bolt comes off and makes it into a package you detect it. But in order to detect plastic components uh, equipment manufacturers actually have to use metal impregnated plastics so they can be picked up by metal detectors and even random inert other things within your facility, something simple like a Band-Aid. If you want to be able to pick up a Band-Aid um, from a metal detector, you actually have to purchase um, metal detectable Band-Aids and then you have to enforce all that internally. Um, so if you really want metal detection to be a success, there's a lot of peripheral things that need to be addressed as well. Um, X-ray on the other hand kind of addresses this. So the basics of an X-ray unit and packaging is real similar to what you see at an airport that scans your bag. Um, the difference is instead of a person watching a screen, it's actually computer algorithms that are picking up on everything. So it's great for particle detection identification. It can detect virtually any foreign object. Um, it is, however, higher priced than metal detection. It's a much higher end technology. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot more training and startup costs associated with it. Um, but it's where a lot of people are moving just because it, it's, it's a lot more bulletproof than metal detection. So lastly, in package inspection, we'll talk about seal testing. Um, a common test is a destructive bubble emission test. So these basically use some chamber like you see here, often filled with water. And it's, it's a thicker plastic with a seal around it. Um, so you take, it's a destructive test. So you're taking a sealed package and you're placing it inside this chamber and basically closing the lid. Um, and then with the flip of a switch, it's gonna pull a vacuum in you can typically adjust what vacuum level it pulls, but it's designed to stress the package to simulate um, elevation changes and things like that. And so when you throw a flexible package, you actually see the package inside the vacuum start blowing open like a balloon. Um, so this tests the seal and film strength and integrity. So if you, if you pull a really, really strong vacuum, um, 
you might be able to take the pouch to failure and you can see how it failed. Did the film itself split? Did a seal split and go out? Um, or maybe you don't get full package failure, but you actually get a small channel leaker. And these are kind of the silent killers to a lot of packaging operations because you can get a very small bubble leak and there's common areas in a package like around the zipper or in a stand-up pouch around the gusset where these small channel leakers develop. And if you have a product that requires a very strict microclimate maintained with you know a high barrier film and even if you're gas flushing to get your shelf life, if you have a small channel leaker, that product is essentially gonna go stale and degrade long before you projected it to. And so a channel leaker is not something you could ever pick up by visually inspecting a seal. And so that's kind of a saving grace is to make sure that some percentage of uh, filled pouches off your line, you're thrown into one of these chambers and testing them. So now we'll touch on something often overlooked, which is the footprint and utility requirements. Um, one of the obvious things is to just literally make sure you have physical space for it, but it's important not to think 2D. Um, sometimes you might look at physical floor space and yeah, you have plenty of room to bring equipment in, but some of this equipment can stack up pretty tall. So if your facility wasn't originally designed around automation, you may have a lot more office type ceiling environments where you have eight and 10 foot ceilings, but a lot of automation might require 15 or maybe even 20 foot ceiling heights. Again, if your facility wasn't really built around automation, you might not have compressed air ran through it. Um, so a lot of machine builders, we use lower cost actuators to move things around and these actuators require compressed air. And so it's, in facilities designed for automation, you've got centralized air compressors and then that air is ran through pipes around the facility with drops all over. So similar to, you know, plugging something into a wall, it's also assumed that you can then just plug something and get compressed air. So making sure that you have that not only in your facility, but that your compressors and sort of all those piping is sized correctly is a critical consideration. And another basic thing is just electrical requirements. So it's, it's pretty common that entry level machines just plug into the wall, which would be, you know, 120 or 240, wherever you are, single phase. But um, larger machines can often require, you know, three phase power or much higher current rating. So it's important to make sure that your building um, can actually handle that utility requirement before you make that investment in automation. So now I'd like to touch on scaling automation, which is kind of the process of, you know, maybe starting small and then growing to higher end, more higher speed systems. Um, one thing we see a lot of, if you kind of look at this top picture here of hand filling, um, and we'll run this video here uh, of, of more automated bagging operation, it's really important to, to bring batch and run size into the equation. So, if you're doing small batches of say cannabis flour, it's, it might make sense to actually stay either hand filling or maybe have like a semi-automatic operation where you have a machine, but you're still doing some of the work by hand because you're constantly running small batches and having to change over. And so a lot of people will just look at automation as kind of like the silver bullet, but it still needs to be set up and changed over. And as you change products or strains, you've got to do clean out. So, if you have small batches, that's a very important consideration than what your automation looks like. If you're running a lot of large batches, that's an important consideration because you might get away with investing in higher speed and, and more automation. So it's worth talking um, you know, with your supplier about going over semi-auto versus fully auto. Um, and then to be honest, certain operations, you might think you're ready to automate because you're tired of stuffing you know, pouches by hand, but sometimes it, you might have to stick with um, more of a manual process out of the gate till your volumes get to the point where it actually does make sense for automation. Um, so that actually concludes uh, the presentation for today. Uh, I thank you all for your time. Hopefully you saw value in this. Um, and I think I'll throw it back to Roxanne and we'll, we'll take some of your questions. Thank you very much, Philip. Another fantastic talk. We've already had quite a few questions, so we'll move straight on to the Q&A now so that we can cover as many as possible. The first we've had in is how do I know when or if I'm ready for automation? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, th there's a lot of ROI math that has to be done around it. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll throw my contact info up here. Please feel free to reach out if you need help trying to walk through this math. But 
you really need to look at your batch and run size. And so if you're still doing dozens or maybe a few hundred of something, um, that's usually a sign you might be better off sticking with manual process. It's when you can run thousands of something, especially within one batch, thousands straight. Um, that's usually when it makes sense to at least start looking at semi-automatic. And then when you're stock talking tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions, that's where you really start trending towards fully automatic. So yeah, great question. Thank you, Philip. And the next question, when should we use a pre-made pouch versus making our own? Yeah, so this is something I didn't touch on a lot uh, in this presentation, but we, we focus mostly on pre-made pouches, which is you're, 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 you're buying a pouch already made, and then you're either filling it by hand or investing in the automation that fills it. When you get to really large runs, um, it actually, you can go to a form fill seal where you're not actually buying pre-made pouches, but you're buying film and zipper material, and you have much larger machines that make the pouch and fill it on the fly. So running up to two to four million pouches a year, it still makes a ton of sense to use pre-made pouches. When you start you know, pushing five to 10, it can really start to make sense to go form fill seal. Um, I'll caveat that, however, with a lot of people that hit those volumes, it still might make sense to invest in pre-made pouches, especially in cannabis with child resistance, because once you go form fill seal, you're now the pouch manufacturer. So all that package integrity testing that your pouch manufacturer is doing for you as part of their manufacturing process, you essentially just inherited all that risk and responsibility. So if you're gonna make that leap, it is a giant leap, your changeover times on your equipment are gonna go up exponentially. And then you kind of have to do sort of a risk assessment to see if that lower cost in the consumables um, makes sense for you. Thank you, Philip. And the next question, I live in Arizona. We are a medical use state and are predicted to go recreational, which means we will more than likely have to automate our packaging. What is the average cost for an entry level packaging machine? Great question. So I would say it, it, it varies depending on if you're doing flour or edibles. Um, flour is a highly specialized thing. So even a semi-automatic flour packaging machine, you're probably north of $100,000 uh, for that investment. On the edible side, there might be some more entry level options, more like in the twenty-five dollars to $50,000 range. Um, but yeah, if, if you're doing flour, uh, even an entry level system, you're probably spending north of a hundred grand. But the cool thing is if, if you do it kind of in the module way, and this is what we recommend, that initial investment that you start off throwing more labor at and doing semi-auto, well, actually you get to reuse a hundred percent of that investment to go fully auto. So you might be doing semi-automatic with that investment, maybe doing, you know, 10 packages a minute, but that same investment will let you scale up to a more fully automated operation, maybe doing 30 to 40 per minute with a lot less labor. That's brilliant, thank you, Philip. And the next question, do I need a different barrier for flour versus edibles? Yeah, this, this largely depends on what, what type of edible it is. Um, there's a lot, the, the whole shelf life discussion and barriers, there's a lot to the food science aspect of it. Um, what I will say, and what we tend to recommend is a, a barrier, which is typically like a metallized PET barrier layer for flour, tends to also be a really, really good barrier for edibles. Um, it can actually be overkill for some edibles, um, but if you don't have the time or the expertise to do a formal shelf life study, um, sometimes we just recommend kind of hitting the barrier with a sledgehammer out of the gate and just go with more barrier than you think you would need. And then if you do have the time to actually backfill that with testing, you could maybe drop down your barrier requirements later and, and save some money on, on your pouches. Thank you, Philip. And the next question, what is quicker and easier to fill, rigid or flexible containers? Great question. If you're, if you're doing it by hand um, or in semi-auto, it, it's gonna be about the same. It's, it's when you start entering higher levels of automation rigid containers are easier and cheaper to run at higher throughputs. So if you think about other industries, you know, that use rigid containers like bottling, um, breweries and, you know, Coca-Cola and those guys, those bottling lines run extremely fast compared to, you know, a flexible packaging line. Um, 
So when you're talking about at rate, it is easier and cheaper to fill a rigid at very high speeds um, compared to flexible. However, rigid containers, there's a lot more consumable costs there. Um, so it's just a, a balance between those two. Thank you, Philip. And the next question, what is more economical, packaging by weight or count? Typically by weight um, would be, and a lot of it has to do with if you can get away doing a, a weight-based um, count system. In other words, if you've got pretty consistent piece weights versus uh, if you have to do optical counting or, or go into the optical route. So if you, if you can do weight-based counting, um, then weight or count doesn't really matter because your automation is about the same. Um, but if you're kind of forced into maybe because piece weight differentials, um, having to do an optical counting system, uh, you, you will spend more money relative to your throughput on a count-based system than you would a weight-based system. And we have time for just one more question. Uh, the last question. I understand that gas flushing will help my product shelf life, but by how much? Days, weeks, or months? Yeah, um, unfortunately there's not, a, there's not a straight definitive answer to this. Um, kind of what I touched on on discussing edibles, there, there's a lot that goes into shelf life and there are a lot of labs out there that will do all this testing for you. Um, there's a lot that goes into the actual product itself, whether it's the cannabis flower or the edible um, and the science behind that. And then the pouch or the barrier properties that you're using, it pretty much guaranteed will give you some improvement, but you really need to consider all of those factors. So, you know, case in point, there's, there's some products that, if you got a good barrier, you might get a two or three month shelf life and if you gas flush, you might actually double that. Um, but given the same parameters and maybe just a different formulation than the edible, that may or may not be, be true. You might not have to gas flush at all. And you know, on the food science side, change something that will give you that shelf life. So it's, it's a pretty loaded question. We usually recommend uh, if you can get a lab involved to help you with shelf life testing. Um, if not, if you have the time, literally with your flexible packaging provider, just get a lot of different pouches with barrier properties and then pack some in the different film barriers with and without gas flushing and kind of do your own analysis and test. Thank you very much, Philip. We really appreciate your time today. Just to remind everybody, any questions that we didn't have time to get to will be answered offline as soon as possible. That just leaves me to say thanks again, Philip, and we'll be back soon with the next talk. Mm -hmm.